life is weird. And um, as biologists well know, uh, but many people outside of biology, including other scientists, often don't recognize, the categories often have fuzzy boundaries. And some, you know, some, again, some categories don't. Female and male, not fuzzy. Intersex, fine. That refers to the binary of female versus male. But many categories do have fuzzy boundaries. And evolution often finds a way. And simple rubrics are often too simplistic um, rather than sophisticated. <clears throat> so as it turns out, I can't show my screen here. So I will link in the show notes this uh, article published this week in Science. Uh, the largest bacterium ever found which is surprisingly complex. It's bigger than Drosophila. It's bigger than the fruit fly that is the, um, the, the model organism that's used in so much genetics research and other development, um, developmental biology research as well. So from the lay summary, rather than the actual, like the slightly more theory. Wait, wait, can I, can I raise one issue? Yeah. Okay, as a biologist, hearing that there is a bacterium bigger than a Drosophila, did you say that? Yeah, I, so, so I'm not going to be able to show it, but actually maybe But he, here's yeah. the problem. So there's got to be some biological answer oh, to you're this. You're gonna, it's it's good. All right. So here, I'm just gonna tell the audience what it is that has to be addressed by whatever it is you're about to tell me. The problem is that cells have a limit on their size. Now, bacteria are much smaller than eukaryotic cells, so I guess their limit in size is presumably not governed by this, unless the point is that the transport mechanism for oxygen into the cell is less effective and therefore the ability of oxygen to make it into the cell is greater. So. The question is, how does a very large bacterium get enough oxygen into the interior of its cell, given that its surface area per unit of volume drops the bigger the cell is? How can it possibly exist? So I've sent you a, a relevant picture, Zach, which is just a screenshot from one of the tables in the paper, uh, which uh, that's great. That's actually not even the main intriguing thing, I think, about this research. But as you will see, once it, hopefully this comes through, um, this image from the paper that was just published this week in Science reveals that while this bacterium is indeed uh, longer than a fruit fly, um, in fact, longer than a centimeter. Um, oh, it's like a pine needle. It's super long at them. Wow. Well, so, see, yeah, there you go. Biology works. You can see that it would have to be something like that. Yeah. So, uh, so Zach is still working on the, on the visual for that. When that comes up, it'll come up, it'll be clear what we were just talking about. But here from the lay summary, quote, we usually think of bacteria as microscopic isolated cells or colonies. Sampling a mangrove swamp, Voland et al. found an unusually large sulfur oxidizing bacterium with a complex membrane organization and predicted life cycle. Using a range of microscopy techniques, the authors observed highly polyploid cells with DNA and ribosomes compartmentalized within membranes. Single cells of the bacterium, dubbed Candidatus theomargarita magnifica, although thin and tubular, stretched more than a centimeter in length. Ah. So um, that that's all fine and interesting, and I, I love that you just did that live. You're like, how is it possibly going to work? You're going to need to you, you have the oxygen get in. Um, so just to make it clear how this solves that problem, the center of this long hair-like bacterium is never far from the surface. So the diffusion problem is solved by the proximity of all of the uh, cytoplasm to the surface of the bacterium. And I am reminded, of course, as all of our listeners and viewers will will recognize immediately of plethodontids. Mm -hmm. um, so, pleth mm, of course, <laughs> of course, plethodontids are a um, a clade of salamanders. Actually, the largest clade of salamanders, uh, and they are lungless. All of them in in the clade, and being lungless, they need to get their oxygen into their bodies some other ways. They're also fully terrestrial as adults, so they haven't retained gills as some of the pedomorphic species of salamanders have. Um, but what they have is, like all amphibians, cutaneous respiration, which is to say they can breathe through their skin. Uh, and as such, what you would predict for all plethodontids, for all of this clade of lungless salamanders, is that they are, wait for it, long and thin, that they're going to have a, a high surface area to volume ratio, just like this new giant bacterium does. Uh, and um, any time you don't have some additional way to basically pump oxygen into the body or do gas exchange uh, via an active mechanism such as most vertebrates have with lungs, uh, you will you expect to have either a different solution 
um, you know, gills in water where, where the oxygen is being pulled out of water, uh, or, uh, or a solution that has been happened upon a number of times, uh, increase the surface area to volume ratio. Um, by uh, making yourself long and thin. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, the really the reason my screen has died. Um, the reason this came up for me here in particular may be of you know we may be just deep down a rabbit hole here, uh, but one of the ways that this bacterium pulls it off is that it has. Uh, let's see, and I don't have the paper pulled up because I can't show it. But uh, if memory serves. Yes, there are, and this is just um, the last the last phrase in the actual abstract of the paper. Compartmentalization of genomic material and ribosomes in translationally active organelles bound by bioenergetic membranes indicate gain of complexity in the Theomargarita lineage and challenge traditional concept of bacterial cells. So to translate that, bacteria are what are called prokaryotes. They don't have their genetic material. Uh, encased within a nuclear membrane. They don't have a cell nucleus. And so what you have, boy, two to three, I, I can't remember, one to two, two billion years ago, a long time ago, is the evolution of eukaryotes, uh, which is to say the origin of a cell no nucleus and the encasing of the genomic material of, of the DNA uh, within that nucleus. And so bacteria, it's all, it's, it's, they're, they're simple. They're understood to be simple and there's no compartmentalization. And so the organelles and the, and the DNA are all just kind of free floating. Well, not so this bacterium. So this is not a eukaryote. This is a different evolution of compartmentalization of genetic material, but within what is clearly a bacterium and not within a eukaryotic lineage. And, you know, this may, this may well held no interest at all for many people. But for me, this just re this reminds me precisely of how our categories can be real and accurate. And we can say, okay, we know what prokaryotes are, and we know what eukaryotes are. And what those things are actually describing is lineages. And we've got eukaryotes with compartmentalization of DNA. And that starts to be what we think of when we think of eukaryotes. Well, are there bacteria are still around? It's like crocodiles, like crocodiles evolved a long time ago and they haven't changed much. It must be working for them, right? There's a lot going on with a lot of yeah, bacteria. It's a, it's a good design that it can compete with more modern design. Exactly. They're just, they're sticking with what they've got. Unlike, you know, humans who've been changing rapidly for a very long time. Well, bacteria is a giant clade. It's an ancient clade. It's more ancient than anything that's eukaryotic. Again, that has um, its DNA sequestered within a nucleus in, in its cells. And yet, even so, there are some bacteria that have solved the solution of how to segregate its, how to compartmentalize its, its working parts uh, via a different but very similar method. Yeah, so another way to say that is that the, the stories that we tell ourselves when we do a good job of synthesis, mm -hmm. the stories that we tell ourselves are true and we can tell because when a lineage violates what we think to be a rule, it violates it in ways that are familiar because it's solving the same problem that its ancestor, which became a eukaryote, right. uh, also solved. Um, so that's, that's uh, fascinating. Yeah. Okay. So I, I hope we learn more about this. This is, a, it, it's still brand new. Um, there's a lot, not, lot, a lot not known. And of course, it raises the question of you know, why, why this bacterium in these mangroves um, is doing this compartmentalization of a bunch of important stuff when most bacteria aren't. And why some? Yeah, that is a fascinating question. And why uh, some eukaryote that had this trick on board by virtue of being a eukaryote isn't in that niche. Yeah. Yeah. Very interesting.